Okay, so um, I think we'll get underway. Um, it's my uh, huge honor to welcome you all to this um, live pitching session on the um, final day of the Global Innovation Forum. It's been a fantastic um, forum, uh, five days, more than 175 speakers, simultaneous regional events um, with one goal to bring the global community to unlock digital ecosystems potential. Um, my name is Carolyn Keenan, and um, I'm your moderator for this session. Um, I've been involved in entrepreneurship and innovation um, in higher education in the UK for the last eight years. Um, and I, I'm you know, super honoured to be involved um, today. So um, the ITU Innovation Challenge winners that we're going to meet today have gone through an incredible journey. Um, and one in which I've been involved in a small part in, in being one of the mentors. Um, and it's, it's been fantastic to get to know them and to hear more about their truly innovative ideas. Um, after winning um, the challenge, they participated in an intense week long boot camp, which was jam packed with sessions on creating sustainable innovation ecosystems. And they were learning how to refine their idea. And of course, the importance of storytelling in their pitch, which we will be in spades today. Um, they all recorded their two minute video pitch uh, with the support of their mentors and submitted them to you, the audience, to vote um, during the forum. So today we are um, delighted to be watching the seven most voted for um, pitches. And um, the criteria used to shortlist um, the the ones that we're seeing today was um, three, and it was the potential for funding, um, whether it was an impactful solution in the age of COVID-19, and whether there is the ability for it to be replicated. Um, so you're going to see seven videos in the, in the next hour, and um, I'm delighted to be joined by um, the jury of experts who will select the best three from um, the pictures that we see. And the, those three will be announced in the awards ceremony this afternoon. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, the members of the jury that you can obviously see up there on the screen. So I did say hello to um, Sylvia Paul, um, Barbara Lawrence, Norman Schreppel, Sophia Sidrum, and I'm not sure whether we've been joined by Maren as yet. She may be, may be joining us um, in a little while. So hello to everybody. Um, an, an unenviable task, I think, um, we've got today. So the way um, the session is going to work is that each um, shortlisted pitch will be played. The, the two minute video will be played. And then the jury have um, the opportunity to ask questions of each of the um, entrepreneur that's pitching. Um, before we get underway, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all the participants, all the mentors, all the ITU challenge winners, and also the organizers in the background without whom none of this would be possible. So yeah, huge thank you to everybody who um, has made this such a fantastic event. So um, we'll now turn to the first pitch. So I'm delighted to invite, or we'll see the video um, for um, Health Tech Lab uh, by Ivana Kostic from Serbia. Hello from Belgrade, Serbia. My name is Ivana. Have you heard about the glove for the blind and visually impaired people, which can help them with more than 10 different functions, some of them being recognizing the colors or seeing the bus number or moving around freely. So this is just one of more than 60 innovations coming from Health Tech ecosystem of Serbia, supported by Health Tech Lab. Health Tech Lab is the first health tech ecosystem of the developing countries such as Serbia. In the near future, we'd like to see more of these innovations coming from other developing countries of Asia, Africa, and South America. 
Currently, there is a huge inequality gap in terms of developing countries being able to develop their own health tech innovations. But we would like to develop a global network of health tech ecosystems of developing countries being supported by health tech ecosystems of developed countries of UK, US and Israel. Furthermore, there is a huge brain drain around 10% in developing countries, which could be cured only by boosting local development. Health Tech Club is inviting all interested partners to develop their own Health Tech Club chapters in their own regions, as well as all other members of international organizations such as UN, World Health Organization, Gates Foundation, and many others who would like to support us and bring this global network into reality. Thank you. Caroline? Barbara, did you like, like to say a question? <laughs> I, I did raise my hand. I wasn't sure what you were saying. Sorry, sorry. I, <laughs> Sophie's mouth was moving, but no sound was coming out. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Congratulations, Ivana, and uh, for, for this beautiful pitch and, and, and presentation. My question is, I, I am wondering how do you see the, the leadership of, of your lab? because it's a beautiful idea, but everyone will want to be part of it. And uh, what will be the selection? Can everyone join and can be everyone lead? Or So I'm, I'm just a bit curious about the feasibility and, and the leadership issues that may arise from this. Mm -hmm. Is my question clear? Yeah? Yes, yes. Thank you so much first for, for the opportunity. And then answering your question, uh, the idea is to create uh, Health Tech Club chapters, local chapters. Uh, we already have as Health Tech Club Serbia and as the originating uh, Health Tech Club ecosystem, uh, specific documentation and guidelines and know-how that uh, we would deliver to the local chapter. And so we would like to have a specific person from um, local uh, Health Tech Club chapter that would be the leader uh, that would then manage and that knows the whole situation that would gather the all interested parties of the ecosystem that we would suggest that should be uh, should be there and uh, considering the person who should be the local leader of the local local chapter uh, we would suggest someone who is not directly involved either in government or medical system or um, entrepreneur but is interesting in building the local ecosystem uh, just in order to be independent and to be able actually to communicate with all these parties uh, because uh, we would have uh, different organizations with different uh, logistics and focuses and you know it's it's good to be someone uh, who is communicative enough and willing and motivated to actually uh, build the local health tech ecosystem i hope this answers uh, your question hi ivana hello hi now you hear me good yes. um congratulations on your very noble and ambitious goal um i have a couple of questions the first is um how do you sustain yourself? How, how do you make sure all the people that work uh, on that project are paid for it or are they all volunteer? And how do you engage other um, outside of your local place right now in Serbia so that they join you? How, how do you entice them to join your cause? Mm -hmm. uh, so about the, the first part of the question, uh, First, it was uh, volunteering uh, from my side and from side of uh, co-founder Damian, uh, definitely, but we're now building uh, membership and sponsorship uh, packages. So basically uh, we have the, the members that are startups and all other parts of the community and also a sponsorship out of health and tech companies that are already developed and that would like to invest uh, in development of novel innovative ideas in, in our ecosystem. And we would definitely suggest that model for all other ecosystem, but it would be also great to have support of international organizations that could additionally support uh, this global network. So, so we do have a model that is functioning here and that we would suggest to, to other chapters, but it would be great definitely to have uh, additional support. Uh, and about the motivation, uh, it's up to now. We, we have partners that will develop Health Tech Club in the region of the Western Balkans uh, and uh, also contacts in uh, Ghana and Washington DC and Ukraine that are ready to, to do it, uh, let's say tomorrow. And uh, all of them are inspired um, 
by their own uh, challenges in their own local ecosystems and actually they require uh, specific guidelines and mentorship and um, to you know further develop and and support innovations that are there and they're happening but they're on their own and they would probably just disappear or uh, you know go into some other uh, developing country to to be used and developed so I think uh, by involving um, other members or, or motivating entrepreneurs from from other countries and um, showing our results and everything that we have done that they're inspired to actually develop it locally and in their own countries thank you thanks ivana and yeah norman has a question yes thanks ivana for for the great idea one one question on basically the knowledge that will be circulating um uh, in in the network the clubs itself as we know that health techs or digital health is actually not really a problem about health because there's so many great ideas. It's more on integrating this in awfully complex health systems. And um, so my question is a little bit kind of who comes together in, in, in the clubs? Um, you were saying it, but maybe you can say a bit more on that um, to make sure we don't have to just the tech, but everything else that is necessary to make the tech um, something meaningful. So maybe you can elaborate two, three sentences on this. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so our ecosystem can i just confirm that that is the question to explain a little bit better about who comes into our ecosystem uh, so what we do damian is another co-founder that is not uh, here today with me but he's uh, always supportive about everything we do and he's uh, a patient and he was for a long time uh, president of the patient associations of Serbia. Uh, so we also include patients in our all events, uh, hackathons, and they're always at the center of, of everything that we're doing and of our ecosystem. Uh, so together with startups, uh, patient associations and patients are actually uh, in the middle of, of our ecosystem uh, because we would like to uh, include them in almost all the decisions. And uh, startups are there actually to resolve, thanks to different technologies, the challenges of patients and citizens. And then uh, out of that, uh, we include uh, the, the government that we have tight collaboration with for all the policies uh, and uh, changes that need to be made in order for these innovative ideas to, to get to the patients and to the market. Uh, then we also have uh, funders uh, from different uh, stages and, and involved in different ways. Uh, then definitely companies, health and tech, uh, that we also interact in, in different ways with uh, medical systems of so social and medical care and uh, also collaborators from, um, let's say, incubation and acceleration uh, programs from Serbia locally and internationally that can actually further support through mentoring uh, all the ideas and startups. Okay, thank you, Ivana. That, that's really interesting and I think really comprehensive answers to the questions there. Um, so I think now we're going to move on to our next video. Okay, um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to see next um, the video for, from um, India, um, Bully Idea from Indonesia. It's never easy to speak up about your harassment story publicly, but I'm hoping that my story can inspire you to end the culture of humiliation. My name is Agita, and I was a victim of harassment. For years I've been working abroad, I was humiliated, discriminated, I was cyberbullied by the whole entire co-workers at my office and not even my HR department able to help me. I lost everything. I lost my job. I had a mental breakdown and not even once I had a suicidal thought. So I went back to my home country, Indonesia, and I realized there are over 83 million people exactly experiencing the same thing as I did online abuse, formal harassment during working from home, domestic violence way increased since the COVID-19 over 300% within just three months. So this is what motivated me to finally build Bullied Indonesia, the only online platform 
that are able to help you if you are a victim of online abuse or domestic violence to connect you instantly with licensed and accredited psychologists and lawyers. We've been suffering in silence for years and we need your help more than ever. So please help us and let's save more lives. Great. Thank you, Agita. Um, so is there a jury member who'd like to ask a question first? Sylvia, would you like to ask as you didn't ask last time? Yeah, it's good that we take turns uh, a bit. Um, no, thank you very much for, for that presentation and, and that uh, video. Uh, and maybe can you please uh, explain a bit more uh, this idea, is it focused on, only on your country? What will be the impact uh, in your country uh, by using uh, uh, this app? And, uh, and if this is also something that you plan uh, to scale up and, uh, and maybe uh, how you also make, want, think you can make it sustainable. Sylvia for the questions and it's really delighted to be in here. Um, so let me begin, I think, with the statistic of how many basically in Indonesia who's um, experiencing online abuse itself. We have about 83 million people. In total, Indonesia itself have about 294 million people. And in terms of the mental health and having a depression itself, we have about 17 million who are not um, getting the right um, mental health um, care so far. So um, obviously we started in Indonesia since um, psychologists and lawyers obviously have um, limitations in terms of jurisdictions to basically um, counseling someone who is a foreigner. Um, the idea of Bully Indonesia is an online platform where people basically able to get a help the moment when they need it. So there is a mental stigma in Indonesia where people basically not being able to see the psychologist. Secondly, people do not want it to meet the lawyer because they have no idea how much money they will spend. And it's very, it's very um, common in Indonesia to know that whenever they, you go to the lawyer, it means you have to spend a certain amount of money. So with this online platform, basically people will know to whom they want to speak to and what kind of help they're basically required for the cases and then how much basically money they have to spend or even a time. So the idea is very simple. This online platform is able to connect the victims or the users for the psychologists and lawyers. They have, um, they have basically an option to choose either they want to speak with the psychologists alone or they want to speak with the lawyers alone. Um, in the same time, we have a different um, options of basically how we would like to sustain our idea. The first one, we stay for free, obviously, for everyone who um, need it and everyone who's basically not being able to afford um, in the long run counseling and therapies. And that's going to be handled by the trained volunteers. The trained volunteers itself who are the students in the last semester of their study with a background of psychology and um, law, whether we train them and then we provide them with a recommendation letter and the certificate in the end. So they will be providing a free, con a free um, counseling by the live chat only, by text. Second one, basically for business to um, clients, so the B2C part, and that's going to be handled by the licensed psychologist and licensed lawyer. And how it works is every single counseling, it takes 60 minutes and the psychologist and basically the lawyer have an option whether they want to deliver with text, audio and video, everything integrated with our platform. And we, as a bully in Indonesia, we take the transaction fees. Now, secondly, for the business to business. So what we provide is not just the platform for the employees or the students. Um, to be able to enjoy the privilege for getting the psychologists and lawyers for free, but they also, we provide with the anonymous reporting platform where 
we understand that there's a lot of a sexual harassment done um, and happened at the workplace or even in the university. Um, one of the issue is the victims not being able to share it to the HR department or probably with the teachers. Now with the reporting platform that we built, the victims can always stay anonymous. So it comes from our end and it will be directed to the HR department or the lecturer in the university. So this is what a bundle that we're providing for the uh, company. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Sophia, maybe first. Hello. Hi, Sophia. Um, uh, I, I really commend you on your bravery and courage and wanting to help out uh, people so that they do not go through what you went through. It's really admirable. So kudos for that. Um, now, I understood that from a business standpoint, um, you charge fees to the psychologist and lawyers to whom you bring business. Is, am I right? Um, not particularly. So basically, we charge the fees through the users or in okay. here probably the names. Basically, we, um, because we have a different kind of in-house psychologists and lawyers with a different um, experience. So obviously, it is not right for us to label their own um, price for the counseling. So they have their own um, basically flexibility to put how much that they will charge for counseling, meaning per 60, okay, okay, yeah, per 60 okay. minutes. Um, so we charge to every single transactions that done through our platform. Okay. Do they pay through your platform? No, they, you, yes. you, it, yes. Oh, okay. They pay them through the platform. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, now how, how do you advertise? How do you make sure victims know you exist? How, yeah. how do you grow? Uh, are you big? Are you small? What was the trend? Yes, we started in May 2020. And then uh, one of the strategy we use is basically instead of um, obviously building or uh, growing our own um, community because we're very, very small at the moment. So we partner with the mental health clinics, we partner with the law firm, we partner with the mental health organizations, communities, NGOs, and even the governments who already have an established um, followers or even the community. So we already working very close to it, National Cybercrime Agency in Indonesia. Um, that's for the law perspective. And then we also have been working with the Ministry of Women Empowerment and Children Protections in Indonesia. So um, we've been invited to basically have the platform for us to speak about our platform. And among that, we have already about 90 plus partners and that ranges from media, NGOs, as well as university schools and, um, and um, uh, community um, community. Um, kind of like an NGO youth, yeah. All right, thank you. Last, last one, um, how many users have gone through your platform already? How many victims? And um, do you have a WhatsApp number so that, that people can text or um, a phone number directly that they can call? Yes, so we do have a WhatsApp number. And then for the past um, three months, we've been providing about 207 cases. And um, for in total, including with our awareness and activities, we've been providing about 25,000 um, beneficiaries in total. Thank you. Barbara, did you have a question? I think I had the answer to the Sofian's question and response. So thank okay. you very much. That's great, thank you. So thanks very much, Agita. Um, and I think now we will be um, moving on to our um, next video. Um, and this is um, Tafan Zwa from Zimbabwe um, telling us about agro. Hello, my name is Tafazo. I grew up in a household that relied on farming on a three hectare plot in Norton where our family was caught up in what is known as the smallholder farmer trap. 
where we would spend all the money from the last season to buy new inputs for this season. We we'll spent countless hours in the field. Field and suffer high wastages of farming inputs and losses to our produce, which left us with a paltry harvest and negligible profits that barely sustained us. Statistically speaking, each farming cycle would lose 30% of the inputs that include land, water and fertilizers due to lack of knowledge, unguided farming and practicing ancient farming techniques using predated methods and farming tools. Each harvest, we also lost 40% of the produce due to rotting and lack of proper storage facilities before it even reached the consumer. Inefficient agricultural supply chains led us to sell our produce to the middlemen at lowered prices, hence a loss. Compounded by these problems, we barely turned in a profit each cycle and hence we could not purchase more land or machinery, hence we did not have collateral. That led us to be called unbankable by the traditional funding systems such as agricultural banks hence we could not access funding. As you realized we were trapped in a vicious cycle of poverty without financing, suffering heavy losses without new technology and using backdated methods. With time I gradually realized that 7.1 million smallholder farmers in Zimbabwe and over 300 million smallholder farmers in Africa face similar problems. It became more of a personal mission for me to solve this problem, and that's how Agro was birthed. It is for them to access a self-service agricultural platform to bridge the agro sector. Agro is for smallholder farmers like my family alike to be able to access debt-free funding, to be able to get predictive and reliable markets, to extend their shelf life, and to have access to smart agricultural solutions to ensure maximum productivity and zero wastage in the agro supply chain. Help me make a difference and help me ensure that these smallholder farmers do not fall into similar traps like we did. With your investment and this disruptive idea, we can revolutionize the agricultural landscape. Brilliant. Thank you. Very, very passionate pitch there. Um, who would like to... Norman, do you have a, a question? <clears throat> Hi, thanks. Thanks for the pitch. Um, sounds like a great idea. Uh, now, coming from from a, a bit kind of international collaboration, I know there's a lot of donors kind of um, working on very similar topics. So my question to you would be, uh, did you study kind of um, who else is in that space and what will you do better uh, in terms of uh, the other platforms, the other uh, solutions that actually um, have been already proposed? Um, uh, so maybe if, if you have done some benchmarking or uh, look at you know, like your competitive competitive advantage in, in terms of other uh, players who are in that field, that would be interesting. All right, thank you for the question. So starting with the competitive advantage. Well, if you realize most startups that are focusing on these problems are merely just being another middleman. They're going to take the produce from the farmer then resell it at a higher price to other consumers. What we're doing is creating a digital platform where, where a farmer puts their own price, puts their own quantity what they want to sell, and the person can buy directly from the farmer. We are responsible for the logistics. Then also pertaining mm -hmm. to that, we offer a wholesome solution where we help the farmer get access to smart precision farming technology through renting and farmer input schemes, where as a community, they can rent a drone or new farm systems such as soil sensors as a community, which lessens the price for them. Then also when it comes to rotting and wastage of produce, we also offer upscaling of the produce where we dry it using solar dryers or we freeze it, then we package, then we sell it for them. So we're offering a wholesome service compared to targeting one problem at a time, which becomes a problem for them. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Of course, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this proposal. And I just wanted to understand, um, is, is your idea already, have you already put it into practice? Uh, have you already worked with some farmers, tried it out and, and see if this has been useful for them? Uh, and also, uh, how do you handle the issue about connectivity in the rural areas of Zimbabwe? Do you have enough connectivity? Do you do this through a mobile phone? Or do you do it? Do you, do you have to go through a, through a laptop? Uh, is it an easy uh, platform to use? 
All right, so pertaining to that, on, I'm gonna start with the ease of access and the accessibility to the farmers in the rural areas. So what happens is this platform is accessible through WhatsApp and statistically speaking, WhatsApp is accessible to more than three quarters of the Zimbabwean population. So they can access through WhatsApp or text services, then we guide them through it. Then when it comes to the traction, yes, we have started, when we started, we started in May. Then since then we've been updating and adding more features to our platform. Currently we're carrying out a test pilot in Norton and Dombosha, which are one of the areas that we are targeting on. And we have 107 farmers so far, and we've also moved over 20 tons of produce and have opened investment for over 20,000 Zimbabwean dollars for farmers in our country. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Barbara. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, um, um, it's very nice and, and interesting. And as Norman said, there's a lot of things going on in this sector. And uh, we understand that for this, this challenge, the, the idea is to strengthen your ecosystem. So we understand how you're going to work with the agricultural ecosystem, with the farmers and the suppliers. But I haven't really understood how you are working, are you just a startup or are you also working with other digital actors for the supply chain or, and so I'm, I'm not sure what is your ecosystem as such. Do you understand my question? Because I understand what you are working, who you are working with, but are you just standing alone? Are you just one group of, of uh, developers and, and or do you work with many other partners in your digital ecosystem for this project? So particularly for this project, we are a startup. So we have a team of eight people that are working on it as an individual group. And we also rely on the agricultural extension offices, which are from the government, which are accessible to everyone. I think that's the part that we take on. Great, thank you very much. And Sofian? Thank you. Um, so you don't bring money, you don't bring loan to farmers. You bring anything else, uh, knowledge, uh, access to tools, access to uh, seeds. Is that right? I, don't, I didn't get the first part about loans. You, you, you don't, do you help farmers get loans or do you get them, instead of giving money, you give the tools that they need to perform better agriculture? All right, so what happens is we have three platforms for that. The first one gives them access to funding, which is non-debt funding, the traditional loans, because they do not have collateral. We give them funding through contract farming, where we go to a food processor and you tell them we have farmers that can produce, let's say 10 tons of tomatoes for you. Then they give them the funding. We provide the knowledge, the technology for them to use. After they farm, they submit their produce to the processors. That means both of the value chain members are getting value. All right, cash advance. Yeah, in some yeah. way. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, next up, I think we're gonna hear from Zainab um, from Canada and Pakistan. Um, on Teach a Kid, Make Individual Life. Hi, I am Zainab and I believe every child should have access to education and digital literacy. And here is my story of innovation that I call Takmeel, Teach a Kid, Make Individual Life. Maria is a young girl, 12 years old, who lives in a small village almost half a century old. Now imagine a place with no internet, no electricity, no school and no teacher. But there is Maria and 50 children like her who need education and are digitally isolated from the world. So one and a half year back, we reached out to her in her own community and presented a digital learning solution, a technology integrated solution with content delivery, digital assessments, and evaluation based on data analytics and artificial intelligence. Do you know what happened in this one and a half year? Maria learned and learned to become the youngest entrepreneur in her own village. 
She dreamed to become first doctor in her village and this year she internationally presented her idea of world peace. This is just one story. I have 1500 more stories from 30 different communities across Pakistan. But this is also a reality. I have 22 million children in Pakistan and 258 million children across the globe who still need access to education and digital literacy. I want my innovation to reach every child without education and digital literacy till there is no child left behind. Let's join hands to teach a kid and make a life. Join me in this mission and support a dream of Maria and millions of children like her. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Such an important issue that you're, you're addressing there. Um, who would like to ask the first question, Zainab? Barbara, thank you. Yes. Wonderful, Zainab. It's a very beautiful story. I have a very short question. Um, what, how do you handle the language issue? with your solution? Because in many countries, because you, you are very ambitious, many countries, the more you go in the country and the more different languages are being used. So what is your solution? Is that all in English or is that also you, in, in, with you using NLPs to have it in other languages? So what is your solution for the language barriers and overcoming this barrier? Yes, um, and this is the issue that I faced in my country also. So what we are doing at the moment is that we are making use of the available resources. So we have community-based facilitators and they speak the native languages and they're the source who are facilitating the whole process. In Pakistan, we have some content that is being developed in the local languages or the Urdu language, the national language. So we are making that available. But as we spread our wings in other countries, I know this would be a challenge of the language and in every country i think there are some open resources educational resources available in that particular language and we can make use of that so we are not actually developing the content we're making use of the open educational resources and aligning them with the curriculum needs or the learning outcomes they need for their children and starting from basic and then progressing them to the higher learning outcomes so this is what we are doing <laughs> Sophian first and then norman Hi, Zineb. Uh, congratulations on your endeavor. Um, how many children uh, have been taught or are being taught right now and who pays for their education? Yeah. Um, so at the moment till now, since 2017, I have reached out to 1500 out of school children in 30 different communities across Pakistan, different cultures, uh, completely rural areas. Some are the interior communities where there have been no school and some are like uh, terrorism affected areas of Pakistan also. And uh, if I talk about the uh, model of funding, yes, there are two things. When I started off, I started with the funding from the Pakistani community and the pool of donors in USA in different regions and you know fundraising on annual basis and directing those channels for these kids. But now I, I believe that it's not a sustainable model. And I see a product in, in this technology while I was developing that is the data-based evaluation of the student's learning outcome. And that is a product that can be offered to the students and schools in the established school system. Now, if I offer the schools that yes, I have a technology that can tell you through data driven model, why your child is performing the way it is performing, I can make use of that product and generate a revenue stream and direct it for these children. So connecting the children who are in school and those who are not in school through this revenue channel, that is my plan and I'm taking a transition towards it now. Thank you. I like it. And Norman, do your question? I was wrong. Thank you. That was uh, kind of being answered now. Thank you. Okay, great. And Sylvia, did you have a question as well? Okay. I think it's fine. I think she's been quite extensive. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Zainab. That, that was, um, I think you, you, get, you gave such comprehensive answers to the questions there. So, um, We'll move on to our next um, pitch, and um, this is uh, uh, Chidi, and he's going to be telling us about Publicia. Hi, 
Four years ago, my twin brother made music. So I told him about an aggregator in the United States that can help him make money out of it. He distributed his music with them, had huge sales, and was so excited. Unfortunately, the platform and other existing aggregators pay royalties via PayPal, which here in Africa, we do not have access to. So he had to go for the alternative payment method, which was check. Two months down the line, the check never came. He reached out to the platform to know why. And that's when they discovered that somebody in Oslo, Norway, intercepted his check, used a fake ID, and took his money, and my twin was devastated. A year later, he said to me, Chidi, I'm not the only African creative that has gone through this kind of problem. Why don't we create a platform that solves this kinds of problem for African creatives? And Publicity was born. Hello everybody, I'm Chidi Wogo and I'm co-founder and CEO of Publis here, a platform that has helped over 6,000 African writers, musicians, filmmakers and video game developers, typically those from low income and disadvantaged communities, to earn over $240,000 in revenue from their ebooks, audiobooks, short and feature films, music videos, digital music and video games. Thanks to our partnership with the International Publishers Association and the International Publishing Distribution Association. Our service is at no charge, but we take 25% of the revenue we, we generate for them. And we, this goes back into helping more creatives and creating a self-sustaining company. Every day we discover local African talents and we give them a platform to do what they love doing the most while we handle the business of transforming that creativity into wealth for them. Join us as we empower the African continent and simultaneously change the African narrative by promoting the beautiful culture and heritage of the African people to the rest of the world, one content at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Chidi. Great pitch. I like the movement in the, in the pitch. You should have had some music in the background. <laughs> okay, who, who would like to ask the first question? Sylvia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That was a yeah, very good pitch. And, and uh, I just want to better understand, um, because you already mentioned revenue and that you have around 6,000 artists uh, that are, are using your platform. Uh, who are you selling to? Who, who is it in the, in the African continent? Or are you also scaling up and, and being able to, to offer uh, these products uh, to in other markets. So just to understand uh, uh, the the market op opportunities. Yeah, and thank you for the question. So we sell to everybody. We sell outside Africa and we sell within Africa. We have uh, 413 uh, partner stores. This includes local and international stores. Uh, we've partnered with Amazon, Bands & Noble, uh, Spotify, iTunes, um, iFlix and Hulu TV. Uh, we've partnered with 413 stores and also in Africa we partner with Habari, Okada Books and Spinlet you know so we distribute to these platforms because they are well established and hundreds of thousands of people are constantly using these platforms to discover new content and so uh, we what we do the, 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 the entire process is very simple once we get a content from the creative we fine-tune the content industry standard this includes uh, book editing book formatting uh, music remastering and so that we do that so that they can compete on a global scale then we distribute it to our partner stores, um, which who, that receive millions and, 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 and you know, billions of views every day. And then uh, you know we aggregate their revenues. And these creatives, they can they, we have a centralized dashboard where they monitor their sales across all these platforms, so they can know where they're performing best and where they're not performing good. And you know then we you know aggregate their revenue and pay it into their local bank accounts or into their mobile money wallets for those who, do, who you know who don't have you know. Uh, more uh, bank accounts. And so we also have an offering submission process because we discovered that a number of them don't have in internet access. So we have a platform where they can, you know, submit their content to us without internet, you know, just using things like uh, a hard disk or just sending it to us via SMS, you know. So this way we, we are able to also reach out to people that are not, you know, that are in remote villages and just able to help them to earn uh, a living from their creative content, yeah. Barbara. Yes, thank you, Chidi. You, you've made a, a wonderful pitch. And it seems that we don't even see any problem in your in solution. It's like just wonderful and so, so many opportunities. So now I would like to ask you the question. If you had to pick just one challenge that you think could make you fail, 
in your proposal? What, what is it? And how do you address it? Because I'm sure on, on a daily basis, you're facing obstacles, right? So it's not that beautiful. There must be challenges. So, so if you can just pick one. Yeah, so um, we're a company and, uh, like every other and we have challenges. When we first started the company, the first challenge we had was low sales. And we discovered that the reason why we had low sales while starting out was because a lot of the content that we were distributing were being re returned back to us. And the reason was poor quality. And that was why we decided to fine tune the contents first before distribution. And that was to get that challenge. But now we have another challenge, which is piracy. You know, we discovered that uh, some of the content that we distribute, other people, you know, are distributing this content illegally. And so we are also, you know, we, um, we partnered with uh, Google Play in 2018 and you know part of the the, the partnership was to uh, to fulfill its publishing uh, request in Africa and you know with that connection we we're able to reach out to them and ask them if they can you know help us to support us to be able to track where our contents are that you know that we do not you know we don't know about and so we've been able to also be able to find out where our contents are that you know we don't know about and we are able to uh, mitigate this challenge but however we still have a loophole because we discovered that not all not all uh, content are on Google Play that are also on other plat platforms we have content on Amazon that are not on Google Play and so we still have some piracy issues on Amazon and Spotify and other places and so we manually at the moment we are manually uh, figuring out how we're going to um, Find out, you know, find where all these places are. But at the moment, we've been able to reduce it by over seventy percent because Google Play has a lot of content. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, Tofa? Chile. Okay. Oh, Norman. Yeah. Just very quickly, I love love the idea. Um, the what what do you say is your market kind of or the content of the the the. the the market of the content here kind of distributing. Is this um, kind of platforms that are mostly finding their market in Europe and North America, or is it kind of particular platforms actually targeting an African market? Because I think it's it's, rather, it's very different if you, you know, like try to um, bring content to, to a local market or a regional market or to a global one. So just to clarify, you know, do you, do you, do you feel like it's the big platforms that basically operate in Europe or North America, or is it more like regional or African platform you're working with? So we, like, like I said earlier, we have uh, 413 partner stores and all of them, you know, some of them are local stores and some of them are international stores. And when I say local stores, I mean that they are owned by Africans like Boomplay. And when, when I say international, we have Amazon, they are owned by you know, Western companies. So we distribute to all of these stores because we discovered that, like for example, Nigerian music is kind of international. We also have Nigerian music played in all parts of Africa. When I travel outside of you know, Africa, I hear Nigerian music. When I travel you know, to Kenya and other parts of you know, Africa, I hear Nigerian music. And so we distribute to all these stores. However, we only target five countries at the moment. So when we say attack, we only target five countries. This means that we only receive con contents from these countries, you know, so we are working with creatives. When I say creative, I mean writers, musicians, filmmakers, and video game developers. And we're only working with those from Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, and Egypt. And uh, the reason why we're doing this is so that we can give them quality service because we don't, we don't only do distribution. We also do other services like content protection. We protect their work from intellectual property theft and illegal distribution. And the only way we can do this is when we have a close connection in their country to be able to copyright their content and, you know, give them that, you know, that really strong uh, um, uh, service. And that is the reason why we only work with these five countries at the moment. Um, before the COVID hit, we were about to expand to other parts of Africa, especially French speaking countries. But you know, with the, with the COVID hit, we couldn't expand because it needed us to have some physical travels. But once you know, the pandemic is over, hopefully very soon, we intend to you know, expand to other parts of um, Africa, especially France, French speaking Africa, and then maybe to other parts of, Af um, other parts of the world, like um, India and Philippines and you know, other emerging uh, um, markets outside of Africa. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Judy, very much. Um, and I think now we're moving on to our um, next person, but I'm not sure whether we need to go on to a new, a new Zoom now, or will we watch this one on here? You can keep going. We have created another Zoom for the next session. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to hear from um, Neela, I think from Bangladesh, um, about her project Women in Tech, uh, sorry, Women in Digital.
In 2009, I worked as a software team. I remember I received an email from my boss. They had given me a salary increment. Increment when I was expecting for a promotion. I asked my boss why I didn't get the promotion. He replied, "It's a software company, and we are not promote women here." It's a 24 by 7 service company and women are not able to stay at night in office. I was shocked. I believe technology does not have any gender. Gender inequality is not just a problem in Bangladesh, it's a common situation in all over the world. I am Atiya Nila, founder of Women and Digital and I wanted to solve this problem. I made an ecosystem where women teach, women run, women own and take social enterprise. Yes, I'm talking about women in digital run, managed, owned by 100% women. Our main motto is women empowerment through technology and we are ensuring their financial empowerment through technology. We are working in urban areas and at the same time we are working in rural areas. Last seven years, we have trained almost 10,000 women and most of them are com contributing in our digital economy. We have arranged National Hackathon for Women first time in Bangladesh, even in South Asia. We have launched our initiative in Nepal and now we are planning to launch in other South Asian countries and all over the world. So support us in our mission to empower more women in technology and choose women in digital as the IQ Challenge 2022 winner. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Atiya. That was uh, that was just a really interesting um, video. Um, Sylvia, would you like to ask a, the first question? Yeah, I think if you can further go into more detail how you you uh, feel that you want to empower more women, uh, if that could be clarified a bit more, and uh, and how do you plan to? Is it something that you already are working on? How many women have you? already uh, engaged with and and how how many you have been able to help thank you sylvia for the questions um in, in 2013 i have taken this initiative in bangladesh because uh, i am myself a computer engineer and i do the programming things and when i join a international uh, multinational company in that time i get one problem so they are trying to uh, dominate me always and uh, they, uh, they suggest me to join the testing team or uh, the design team. In that time, I feel uh, why I will join um, the testing team or design team because I am a programmer. So I want to do some coding over there and I want to make some software for them. So, But uh, they are insisting me to the join over the, uh, different uh, uh, program because that uh, they suggest me actually uh, women are not able to code so now you are new that's why you are interested to do some coding but for the long run you are not uh, you are not able to go a long way so you should stop here and take uh, your career on designing or testing teams so uh, I, uh, I actually uh, I, I am not able to take the, the, their decision because I love to do something uh, coding so I did not take, uh, I take it very seriously and I promise I will uh, complete my uh, job cycle like I was joined as a junior software engineer and I completed the CTO and then I take my initiative in Bangladesh and initially I start uh, teaching uh, some girls in my home and uh, then uh, I give them some uh, outsourcing work and I, I, see, I see one thing so I teach them and I, I believe one thing so for uh, coding, uh, you, you don't need to uh, learn or complete the four-year four -year engineering thing. So if I teach someone and uh, they can learn it immediately, within eight months, we can get a result and they can earn. So I believe uh, we can do women empowerment when they are financially empowered. And I, as a media, I choose uh, technology. So I teach them and then they are start working in my team. So in a, initially we uh, launched a digital agency. In that time, uh, we are working for international market. And in that time, I face one common problem. Uh, women are not interested to come in my agency because uh, all are women and they feel afraid with they are able to do the coding things and all those things. So. Then I start, uh, I uh, launch a, uh, technical schools in uh, uh, one urban area and I start teaching the coding. 
and then uh, they are they they when they learn from my uh, schools and they are working in my team and when they uh, learn and they, in the same time they can earn then they feel more interest to join in my team and then i started in uh, uh, i, I started in dhaka in the capital of bangladesh then i, I started working in the rural area also so uh, we are going uh, one area and we arrange a workshop and we pick one or two community lead and we teach them uh, initially uh, uh, training for teachers and after that the uh, the girls uh, they are collecting other girls from her community and they teach them and that is the way we are teaching our own co community and they are working in our uh, uh, team so uh, we are working in the international client and we connecting uh, the, those who are graduates from our uh, institute we they are immediately working in our team and those who are actually we are not able to afford everyone so we promote them in different uh, software companies so that is the way we are actually running our business and we are working the women in technology and we are bringing more women in tech and uh, we are try uh, we are replicate this model in nepal also now so it's very uh, first stage of our initiative in nepal thank you any other questions yes j just one quick question hello and congrats on your initiative um uh how many girls have you trained so far and who paid for that? Uh, thank you, Sophia, for the questions. Uh, we have uh, trained almost 10,000 women in all over the Bangladesh. So initially, actually, I, I am trying to um, use my own money. But uh, that is actually really difficult for me uh, because uh, it's a very big model and I cannot afford everyone. So um, we just start uh, taking a donation from some international uh, organization like uh, we have a, 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 a complete one project with uh, Bill Gates Foundations. We have a partnership with the British Council. We have partnership with Microsoft. So, uh, so for the training purpose, we take help from them. And for work per, per, uh, purpose, we are promoting the, uh, them, the uh, graduate student, to the different multinational companies and uh, local companies. So uh, yeah, that is where we are working. And we're also sharing uh, uh, some part of our profit for the education, the women education. Great. Thank you. Okay. So now I think we will uh, move to our final um, pitch of this session. And um, it's Leila from Oman with Smart City Ambassadors. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tia. That is technology. <laughs> <laughs> there had to be one, didn't there? Yeah, we, all, we always have such, uh, you know, cases. Yeah, share it with yours. <laughs> Yeah, maybe because you want to hear my voice first before my video. Yeah, probably. We'll see how they get on, if they can, hopefully they can rectify the issue. Otherwise, I'm sure you know your pitch by heart, so you can go live. Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay with you, Leila, or do you want me to? I'm trying to find the YouTube video. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I'm going to wait you, and uh, if it's a little bit complicated, I can't go live. No worries at all. All right. Um, if you want to go live, you can go ahead. All right. Should I go live? <laughs> yes, I think so, Leila. If that's okay with you. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Leila, and I'm from Oman. And uh, if you don't know Oman, I hope that you are going to open Google Maps so you can where's my country. And the idea of uh, Smart City Ambassador started, you know, and I always I'm encouraging everyone that you have to go and check the Google map, where is the Oman and how it's located. We have a very long coast from the north to the south. And when we started Smart City Ambassador, I was having a critical challenge. And the challenge was, will we, will we be able to uh, work in the awareness and the building capacity for smart cities around Oman, because we were based in Oman, in Muscat, the capital of uh, Oman. So it was really challenging. Even the human resource, there was a, a challenge in the human resource because mainly only four people 
not dedicated for the smart city platform. We have been like working as a part-time job. So it was really challenging. So we said, how can we uh, be able to reach everyone? Because every one of those start is just Moscow, the smart city, what about us? How can you reach us? And also the idea was also related to the pain that all of us as a countries in 2016, most of the countries, it collapsed financially. And we used the regular transformation to provide a lot of training. It was a luxury evening training and suddenly we stopped because there was no money. So should we stop because there's no money? So the idea said, why not empowering our own community to have our own ambassadors who can work with us and we can also work with them. And the best thing about it as a smart ecosystem, they are working with us as volunteers. Everyone they will say how they will get benefit from it. They get benefit from it because we are also marketing from them and we are also creating our own database as smart city ambassadors. And also what is best in this ecosystem, it can be applied in any organization in any country. All what you have to do is your own human resource in your organization and the social media is very important because you know the social media is also part of the chain management if you want to market for any community. So that is power of the community of practice in smart city ambassadors that can be adapted in any country. And thanks all. Thank you. Um, I've just got a quick question actually to start with. So um, could you just maybe um, give us a little bit more detail of what exactly the ambassadors would do once you've recruited them? Okay, the ambassadors are going first to deliver uh, uh, awareness sessions in different emerging technologies. And when we started that, we started in different technologies, but we decided to start for each technology in each month. Because when you speak about emerging technologies, everyone, they will get the term emerging technologies, but then they, for, they will forget about it. So we focus in the first month, it was about blockchain. And we got only six ambassadors to deliver awareness sessions in three cities around Oman. And we say that is a success for us because you know the, the beginning is always challenging. The next month we got uh, 10 ambassadors in more than five cities uh, talking about big data. The next, the third month, it was about IoT and we get around 22 ambassadors in more than 12 cities around Oman. And that was you know, the biggest success for us. And we have started to expand around Oman. And now we are also expanding globally. We have you now some ambassadors who are joining us from different countries to this uh, awareness, uh, to this uh, platform of smart ambassadors. And now some organizations are getting back to us. For example, recently we have two projects in Oman. One is by the Ministry of Environment and one is by the Ministry of Housing. The Minister of the Environment they came to us, we need your help. Can we get the uh, help of your ambassadors? Because sometimes we are also involving them in knowledge cafes so they can also work as consultants with organization, not just you know awareness session. So you can see how we expand it. It's not just a matter of delivering a knowledge, but they can also uh, deliver the consultancy free of cost. Thank you. That, that's really painted a picture for me there. <laughs> Who else has a question for Leila? Norman, thank you. And then Sophie. Hey, so my question is a little bit on, on kind of the authority of the ambassadors, you know, like why why are they accepted uh, either by the communities or by, by those who are doing decisions? Because, you know, that, that might be crucial, you know, in terms of uh, either they're being particularly competent and they know things others don't know or because they're actually very good embedded in, in, the, in the ecosystem they're actually talking to, be it the community or be it, you know, like the decision makers. So how do you make sure actually these these ambassadors are becoming real ambassadors. Uh, we have got, uh, you know, in our database, uh, more than 700 people registering in our platform. But, you know, the active ambassadors that we have empowered them because we are also having the social media. So whenever there is one ambassador participating with us, we market for him through our social media. That has encouraged the other ambassadors to work, you know, uh, hard, uh, you know, uh, to work uh, from their heart so they can be part. And you know, some of them they said we are also registered as ambassadors. Why our photos? Because if you can see, you know, uh, one of my presentation, it is uh, that I have spoke about it uh, two days ago. We have the picture of our ambassador who participated. And some of them they said I cannot see my picture. I told him because you haven't. 
uh, work with us uh, till now. If you are going to work with us, you will see your picture with the other ambassadors. So that is how we value the ambassadors by also marketing for them uh, through our social media. And some of them, they get also chances so they can represent us and speak in conferences uh, or uh, you know, in different events. I hope that they have answered your question, Norman. And, and Safiya, do you have a question? Yes, many questions again. Uh, no, it's not, it's it's uh, based on volunteer. Do you have a plan to transition that to business, or will it stay uh, volunteer based? Uh, the best thing that we also, you know, uh, when you speak about ecosystem, you have also to get the support of the financial side. And uh, we have the financial sector, uh, you know, uh, sponsoring the smart city platforms, both sponsoring uh, the technical, which is the, our uh, website, uh, the social, our social media, because our social media is run by SME in Oman. So that's how also we are emp empowering also uh, the small companies in Oman. And uh, the companies, we have three companies sponsoring us. And it is uh, the Oman Tel, which is uh, the first telecommunication company in Oman. And we have also Amran, it is based on the construction and tourism. And the third one is Nama, it's based on the sm smart metering and electricity and so on. So not all of these, these are the main sponsors, but we also have other sponsors. When we started, Nobody come to us, but when we started succeeding with our ambassadors, now everyone is coming to us and they say, can we collaborate with you? So that's how we do it. And uh, with our uh, ambassadors, they are willing to do it free because they have seen the successful stories of their ambassador, of their colleagues from the ambassadors. Some of them, they were, you know, uh, uh, looking for jobs. And when they started, you know, sharing their knowledge with us, they said, you have helped us. Now people, organizations are asking for us to help them or deliver a knowledge uh, session for them and so on. So that's how we do it. <laughs> Sylvia. Yeah, I just wanted to, because I think she, she, I was having a few questions. She was answering, what do the ambassadors get out of this? And I think she's answered this a bit. But how do you ensure what type of message the ambassadors and with the work they do? Uh, is there some quality control that you ensure that they're 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 really putting out the message that you need? And and if you say you're even sending them sometimes on speaking engagements, uh, how 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 do they, they fit into the the organization? For any ambassador, we have first to ask from them to provide us with their CV. And we have also to do like uh, a call interview with them so we can you know examine these ambassadors and uh, through this and after their session we uh, send a, a survey link to all the attendees and through that so we can make sure that they have uh, provided a very uh, well content to the uh, you know stakeholders and that's how it's doing and i'm always saying you know in any country uh, sometimes they are very good sometimes uh, for example some of our ambassadors are academia and they never participated outside their academia, uh, you know, environment. And uh, when they joined us uh, in the Smart Simpson platform, they said, you gave us a chance so we can go for outside the community, so we can provide our help to everyone. So some, most of them, they are academia, some of them, they have like SMEs, uh, so they can have uh, smart tools, so they can market for it and so on. So we do it by following up them with these, uh, uh, you know, uh, tools that they have mentioned. I, have, I hope that they have answered your question, Sylvia. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Leila, for you know um, rising to the occasion and delivering your pitch um, in person due to the technical failure. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody who's um, pitched today. You, you've all been amazing, and to, to get to where you are today, it's a fantastic achievement. I hope you're all really proud of yourselves, and now we have to go away and uh, have the unenviable task of selecting three of you um, to be um, announced as winners, but I think, you know, truly you are all winners for getting this far in the competition, so um, I'm sure all the other jury members would like to join me in just saying, um, you know, well done. It's uh, it's not a, an easy thing to do, and I think you've you've all done it incredibly well. So so thank you. Um, and that's the end of this session now. And obviously, as I said at the start, the winners will be announced in the um, awards session this afternoon. So you haven't got too long to wait, which is the good news. Mm -hmm.